Hello. How are you? Pretty good. How are you? Good. I love your hair. I love dark hair and curly hair. So right now, I'm <laughs> thank you so much. I love your hair. It's nice and wavy. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, I'm very excited for this. It's really nice since uh, quarantine is quarantine and everything's just now kind of getting back to normal. Yeah. It's nice to meet people. So. Yes, it is. <laughs> And so I just wanted to know, how are you doing? How are you keeping, uh, how, are you, how are you doing during all this isolation? <laughs> you know, um, originally when this all started, I was, sorry, I'm talking so loud. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> originally when this all started, um, I was doing great. But then I had like a crazy manic episode where I like spent like an hour and a half, like, depilling my mattress cover and shit like that or so sorry <laughs> oh no it's okay you can say whatever <laughs> and stuff like that or like spent like two hours organizing pens by color and size and so you know just weird ocd bipolar stuff and then i had like like a really bad depressive episode and i've been like digging my way out of that for the last month and a half but mm. um so the isolation doesn't do well with my mental but at the end of the day, I'm trying to focus on the things I have to be grateful for, like the fact that my job still exists. And a lot of people can't say that right now. Yeah. Um, I have a home and a good home environment to be stuck in, you know, like, and I am going to therapy like twice a week and all oh, my meds are good. Like, you know, I'm just trying to focus on the positive things. And now that things are getting back to like this, you know, quote unquote, new normal, as everyone's calling it. Um, just trying to feel it out. How about you, though? How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Uh, it's been it's been weird, you know, because uh, you you want to keep up with the news and you want to get as much information as you can, but then there's contradicting information, so you have to kind of sift through all the like uh, what's real, what's not real, you know, and then that causes like you know your brain to just want to explode sometimes. <laughs> yeah, like the mental mental turmoil is so real. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know. I'm one of those people where like, I'm really into politics. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't speak on my political beliefs um, on work time, but I will say, I think this is a pretty non-controversial statement that I'm about to say um, <laughs> right now. Um, the politics, like the politics that have intertwined themselves with this like actual pandemic where people are dying. This has my brain just turning to mush. So I'm like, I can't, like you said, like, I want to stay up to date, but at the same time, like, every time I read something, I just feel myself getting dumber. So yeah. <laughs> it's hard, right? It is hard. It is hard. And I was going to ask you, like, how are you keeping yourself mentally healthy? Because, like, all this isolation, you mentioned two days of therapy a week. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Most people don't have that. So, like, is there, like, any tips that you have for people to kind of uh, get through this? Because I know a lot of people were facing isolation even before this pandemic. Yeah. And now even more so because now you can't talk to other people. You can't be close to anybody. So it's a lot harder. It's very hard. Um, like you said, like, I feel very fortunate. I don't feel for, I am fortunate to get the opportunity to enjoy therapy and medication um, and have that as my backbone. Um, but I also understand, like you said, that that's not an option for everyone. So the thing that's been really helpful to me is like fostering some sort of at least long distance community. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, making sure I'm connecting with and speaking consistently with my friends, my best friend, my artist friends, things like that. And like kind of creating a safe space network, if that makes sense. Um, I've been doing these like little quarantine sucks lives on Wednesday, on Wednesdays on Instagram. And I'll have guests from different mental health organizations who share like the resources they have available for people right now, things like that. And also just kind of share how they're doing right now now and it's been a really cool experience there because I've gotten to take listeners from both my side and the side of the guest and unite them and kind of create a safe space where if you want to bitch about everything that's going on bitch about it if you have questions like oh my god I just lost my job or you know my fiance lost their job or my kids out of school now I have to become a teacher like what we can yeah. all kind of become friends and have a good time together and just vent a little and have a community. Um, I've been really trying to engage with my artist friends and my label mates and my artists outside my label um, and kind of figure out like a, a game plan for everyone and kind of work together on, okay, we can't tour. 
people don't have as much money right now as they did to like buy merch things like that like our support system is getting decimated so how do we as artists survive things like that and just focusing on being proactive and planning for the future rather than being getting too stuck in the hectic fear of the present that's what's been helping me um i wish i could be one of those people who says like yoga and journaling is what saved me mm, but i'm not yeah. And that works for some, like some people are very hippy dippy like that and it works for right. them. I'm one of those people, I need very tactile things like planning and therapy, um, but that's really been what's helping me. And, you know, um, just trying to fix what I can fix, control what I can control, because right now there's not a lot, but what I can affect, I'm going to, you know? Yeah, exactly. And I got a chance to watch your, uh, your short film, Mystic, and I got to say, I loved it. Like... like so I was going to ask you, are you a visual storyteller? Like, do you, like, were you, cause I know that, uh, Taylor Lamb directed and that you wrote it. So like, what was the process with you guys coming together and deciding, Hey, instead of making one music video, let's make an entire short film of this entire album. And let's see if we can try to create a, a story within the whole entire album in, in a visual presentation. Oh my God. I love that you ask this. I absolutely love this. And I haven't gotten this question asked this way yet. So you're about to get a huge answer. So buckle up. <laughs> um, so I'm writing this album, right? Um, and as I'm writing it, you know, I had this mental breakdown in 2018 for the first six months of 2018. Um, and that's what the album is really about. And by the time fall came around, it was time for me to write and record a new album. I was just a couple months into my recovery and it was kind of all in like, absorbed me entirely and I felt like the breakdown really defined me at that point so I didn't know what else I had to write about you know and so that's what caused me to write about it is because I find like I always felt before that I had no substance to me and like that's just a self-esteem thing but now I'm like well there's substance now um, yeah. and um on top of it this was the first time I got full creative control so I had to make the project matter you know this is the first time you're hearing me as an artist and so I'm writing this project I'm writing these songs and I always say Mystic was not created by me. It existed somewhere in the universe independent of me. I just happened to be the person who discovered it and, you know, materialized it, so to speak. And so as it was revealed to me in portions, you know, the cover revealed to me at this state or like this aspect of this song meant this at this state. And now I realize it's about this, you know, little things like that the universe revealed to me. Um, the biggest thing that was revealed was the girl. So what I mean by that is this, as I'm writing, um, I have my narrative, right? But I'm realizing that there's someone else hidden in the songs and an entirely different person other than me. And I'm like, oh my God, like I've discovered this whole being and this whole world within this music. And I don't know how to bring it to light because the songs are so focused on me. And then I thought about visuals for the album and how doing something like a performance music video for A Cut Rose and Top Water, which is about me wanting to kill myself, felt weird. And I couldn't figure out how to get the girl and get her world um, out there, right? I couldn't figure out how to transmit this from my head into reality. And then it hit me, the visuals were my opportunity. And so originally when I brought it to um, our CEO, who's also my dad, Travis O'Glenn, I told him, you know, listen, I have this idea for the visuals and it's very important to me because I think that this thing that came to me is incredibly impactful. You know, there are going to be some people, here's a huge reason why the girl was so important to me is because there are going to be some people who access this content and this message through me. There are also going to be people who don't like me, don't relate to me, but I think they deserve access to the message of the album too and the message of light and like, you know, revival and renaissance. And I want to give them an opportunity. I think that the girls are opportunity. There are more than one ways up one way up the mountain, you know, and she's the other way. Yeah. And so I was explaining that to him and he said, okay, like, let's make the visuals about her, then make it kind of a storytelling thing. And I was like, yes, I want all the visuals to create one narrative. And he's like, okay, like, let's try to make like three visuals, right? Pick the top three songs from the album. And I was like, okay, I'll pick one from each chapter. As I was picking them, I realized each of the song had, had such relevance in their own unique you know, 
aspect to contribute to her story, just like they did mine, that just picking three felt impossible. Because if I pick my favorite three, well, two of my favorite three are the relationship songs. So like, I don't want to just seem like an album about having a bad boyfriend, or like that's her story, because it's not so much bigger than that. But I also don't want to miss out on those aspects, or like do a song that I think is like a lesser song just to make a point, you know what I mean? So I came to this point where I told him, I was like, I'm really having a hard time. And he said, with fear in his voice and like dread in his eyes, he said, I guess um, I would consider if we had to under extreme circumstances, doing a visual for every song on the album. And I was like, oh, okay. And in my head, I was like, I'm doing it. Like, yeah. I absolutely knew in that moment I had to. And it was funny because when we first started looking for directors and a team and all that, you know, cause it didn't start, Taylor wasn't originally gonna be the director. We were looking outside of Strange Music cause he's our in-house um, head of our video department. Um, we were looking and I had one person on the phone and they said to me, and I love this conversation cause it nothing, Nothing motivated me more. She said, I have worked with many artists over the course of my career and every artist I've worked with has tried to do a visual for every song on the album. It won't work. Mm. And I was like, oh, won't it? And so then I immediately went back and I was like, now I really have to do it because I'm not going to have someone just not only not get my vision, but tell me it's not going to happen. Right. No, I'm not standing for that. So then one night after looking for directors, looking for directors, I get a call from Taylor when I'm getting to my house after work. He said, you know, Mac, like, I no pressure, of course, but like, if you can't find anyone you like, like, I would love to direct this. Like, that's always an option. He said, I'm not trying to push myself into the project. It doesn't offend me if you don't choose me, but I just want to let you know that I would be willing to do that if you wanted me to. And then it hit me. You know, we had a similar experience to this when we were looking for producers for the album. We had looked outside of strange music and all this looking for like cool producers to work with and all this. Meanwhile, behind everyone's back, I made an album really, really fast with my mentor Seven, who's our in-house producer and kept it like in the family, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then by the time yeah. they were like, hey, we found some producers. I was like, well, my album's done. Mm -hmm. mm. And so mm. it kind of ended up being the same experience with the director with choosing Taylor is, you know, we tried to go outside the family, but then, the end of the day the best person to direct it was the person who i've known for half my life taylor i've known him since he was like 17 and that's when he started working for us so it, it just seemed perfect it was absolutely perfect so then we get to writing it and this is where it gets hard because uh, yes pieces of her story are revealed to me like i'll be driving down the interstate and it'll hit me oh my god that's what that meant or i'll be sitting in the studio and realize oh i'm writing this and this is what it means to both of us um, but it didn't, ha I was, every detail wasn't revealed to me immediately. So, and there were so many choices and so many things to decode. Like, you know, what, what would a car accident mean to her? What would this mean to her? What would that mean to her? You know, oh, sorry. That's my speaker and my laptop. <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> um, and so it, was like this simultaneous process trying to figure out what the universe was telling me and reconciling it with what I knew to be true. And this all probably sounds so hippy dippy and stupid, but <laughs> this is like, and I know it sounds very like people either are like, I get it, or they're like, you're insane. But I genuinely was trying to communicate with whatever power was out there that was begifting this to me while trying to make decisions for ourselves and after hours and hours of sitting there and me and taylor staring at each other silently <laughs> we finally came up with this beautiful narrative and my priority here was to make a visual series that had 12 beautiful standalone pieces but was just as good as a short film as it was independently and vice versa yeah. And I really, I feel confident that we executed that. Like, I feel really confident in that. So that's how we came to the decision of creating one piece in 12 parts was because it kind of really wasn't my decision at all. I was just doing what I felt like I was supposed to. And that's how it came about. Yeah. And I like, in watching it, what I felt was that it started, I want to say, low like it started kind of almost like like this is the darkest like the bottom that you, as far as uh as far as you can go to the bottom mm -hmm. and then the only way back the only only direction you can go now is up 
and so what what I liked about it was that the ending wasn't uh, like a happy ending, but like a hopeful ending, which is <laughs> which is the story will always continue. Like it never really ends. So there will always be ups and downs. And so that's what I liked about it, that there wasn't a happy ending, but it was hopeful that happiness does come in waves, just that sadness and all these other stuff that that's pretty much what life is. Yes, you got it. You 100% Oh, that makes my heart so happy. <laughs> That's the thing. And like, there was such a, this album was so intentional, right? In every aspect of it. And the reason why I created the album in three chapters, um, four songs, four songs, four songs, is because, um, okay, so say I just did a dark album. Yes, that relatability of, hey, I feel the darkness too is important. But at the end of the day, the moral of the story at the end of that album is just, I'm depressed too, I want to kill myself too later (laughs) and that's not what I wanted to do you know this album was not only about the darkness but about the recovery I was going through and about the future I hoped for so while at the time when I wrote this album I was in you know the first chapter the rabbit hole I'd already been through that when I wrote it I was going through purgatory and then looking forward to the last chapter oxygen and that was where I think this almost divine intervention really did take place the most is when I was writing that third chapter because I didn't know what I was saying 99.9% of the time I (laughs) genuinely was just writing what felt right and saying what felt right and eventually like the more time passed the more I understood it as I actually began to progress towards that direction in my life but you know I just didn't want this visual to seem like hey like it's a one-stop shop you go get help and you're better because that's not true like you said it's a process and it's forever ongoing and so that (sighs) It was just so important to me that that be the message. So the fact that you said that that's what you got from it, I'm like, oh, my heart. Because <laughs> because that's the point. And I didn't want it to have this, like, the last visual shows her um, in Goodbye. The con- Like, it talks about the, or it doesn't talk about, but it displays, you know, the concept of relapse and what that could mean to her. And then her staring in the mirror and just meditating on that. And then we have this moment at the end where our paths depart, right? We don't, we don't know what happens to her after that, but we have this feeling in our gut that it's okay and that she's okay. And that's what was really important to me. So the fact that you're like, Hey, I got it. makes me really happy. (laughs) And I want to know, like, what was the hardest part to film? Cause I know, you know, sometimes you have to go back to those places that you don't want to go to when you're making, especially for music videos, and especially one that's just as emotional, um, what was the hardest thing to film for you? Was it anything in particular? Was it something that you probably didn't think of for a long time? Yeah, so it was very weird going through this because the girl is very real to me um, to a point where people are almost creeped out listening to me talk about her because they're like, you know, she's not a physical person, right? And I'm like, no, to me, she is. (laughs) But um, I was undergoing the most important couple weeks of my life, which was in the best couple weeks of my life, which was filming this. It was the best two weeks, 10 days of my life. it, but they were so important to me and to my career and my personal life. So that was high stress. And I was going through the most difficult years of her life and then the most transformative years of her life. Meanwhile, I'm still in my recovery. So I'm living all these realities at once and my mental was just like, like it was surreal. But the scene that was hardest to film, um, there was one scene where I was like almost threw up um, filming it. Um, I was shaking and like sweating when we filmed it It was horrible Um, was the scene from a cut rose in top water where she gets in the car and starts it um, in the garage because um, when I was going to kill myself that was my plan Um, and that's where we got that from Um, because for me um, I was as I was like you know as depressed suicidal Mackenzie was considering the most logical way to kill herself which is such an oxymoron I was like, okay, well, it's the least gory and it'll be the least painful. So my parents won't be that traumatized when they find me. And then I won't have to suffer too much. I'll just be able to just go. And so then to, I I just, I always knew I'd end up there. I always knew I'd end up in the car in the garage and start it. And so my entire life, I've been leading up to that moment and suddenly I'm in the car and I'm there, not as myself, but as a girl 
did I know that when I eventually got there, it was going to be for a film for someone else? No, I didn't. But it hit me while I was sitting there that this is the moment I've been waiting for since I was six years old. Like, this is it. And this is this moment that I've fantasized about and dreaded and looked forward to and had all these conflicting emotions about. And it's happening right now. But then I walked away and I never thought I would after that moment. I thought that'd be my last moment and then it wasn't. And then that chapter closed, this years long chapter in my life ended just like that. And so that was the most difficult scene to film for me. Um, I was so emotionally exhausted after we filmed that, that was hard. Um, and there were other scenes that were really transformative for me. Um, but that was definitely the hardest. Yeah. And why was it important to kind of put all your cards out there? Like, you know, you're young, you're, you're just starting out. And most people are kind of timid to, to give everyone all of themselves at once. And you kind of like, nope, just here. This is me. This is what I've been through. This is who I am. I'm not going to gloss, make it look glossy and make it look like I, it's been a perfect life. But this is my life. Exactly. Um, the thing for me is like with my first album, I didn't really have creative control. And I felt like after the album was done that I didn't really do anything important. You know, we made a pop album and that was cool. And that was a huge exercise for me because I don't even really listen to pop music. And it was more of an experiment to see if I could do it. Mm. Um, but after it was done, I was like, what did I contribute? And I couldn't come up with a single thing. And so then when I finally had creative control with Mystic, um, I... I felt like it was, I, I had this obligation to do something that mattered. And that was what I had. And they say, write what you know. Well, all I knew at that point was what I wrote about. And if, so like, it was, just, it wasn't even really a choice for me. And then like, there's this phenomenon of, I, like I said earlier, um, this is no secret. I talk about it a lot. Like I hate myself still. Like I have really low self-esteem. I have a really hard time with it. And the only way we can receive love, I think, is through honesty and being forthcoming and, you know, being vulnerable. Or that's the only way I think you can find genuine, authentic love. And so I think um, part of me subconsciously, and it just really occurred to me that this is what it was, um, decided to put all this out there, because, like in the subconscious effort to maybe have someone who resonate with it and feel like and want to be like and love some part of me not and it wasn't like a narcissistic self-centered self-absorption um it was more like i just want to put this out there and you know there's this quote from this writer and i can't remember it exactly and i can't remember who said it so i'm going to do it a grave injustice but you know, she said something to the effect of, you know, I hope long after I'm gone, someone reads these words I've written and thinks I would have loved her. And I think that's really powerful. And so I think that's a huge part of Mystic is trying to put out there what I could to finally feel like I was doing something worthwhile and authentic and to hopefully garner some sort of response from that where um, I felt a sort of intimate connection with other people because like I always say um, I don't do music for the world to discover me I do music for me to discover the world and Mystic is the best example of that because since I put it out there I've had such a community that built itself around it with my listeners and viewers um, and the people who engage with my art were people that I never ever 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 could have suspected would relate to me or care about anything I have to say are coming to me and saying, hey, listen, like, hey, I'm bipolar also. And so this really spoke to me or, hey, like my mom killed herself when I was seven and it's, it ruined my life. And now I'm trying to cope with it or like all these crazy scenarios that are from all walks of life. I have people who are 45. I have people who are 13. I have all the men, women, boys, girls coming and we're creating like a really loving community just based off the fact that I told my truth, you know? Yeah. And that's why I say about Mystic. It was the easiest thing I've ever done, the hardest thing I've ever done. Because the hardest part was that I had to tell the truth, but the easiest part was that I had to tell the truth, you know? Yeah. And it was, you know, there was no, of course, art is poetic and all this, right? But it was really not, I didn't have to glamorize anything. I didn't have to pretend anything or project anything. I just had to say what happened. And then that, the album was there. Yeah. And you said that you, you know, you didn't really listen to a lot of pop. So what do you listen to? Like what it's, what's kind of like Mackenzie's like 
favorite playlist right now? Um, so because I grew up in a rap label, my heart really sits with rap and hip hop. Um, I grew, oh my God, but I also, I grew up in a very diverse household musically, you know, at any given time, it could be Tupac and NWA and TLC or Johnny Cash and Slim Whitman, you know, like it could have been anything. It could be Toxic by Britney Spears, <laughs> or it could be, you know, some weird underground artist who approximately 12 people have heard of. Yeah. So for me, I think that kind of reflects in my musical taste now is like, I'll listen to a little bit of anything. Um, I don't really like contemporary country. Um, that's probably the only thing I don't really listen to that much. Um, but there's really nothing I won't try out. I'll try anything once musically. I'll listen to anything once. And my favorite song in history, I think the best song ever written and recorded is Johnny Cash's rendition of Hurt. I think it's the best song ever written and recorded. But at the same time, the song I was just listening to before this interview, Family Don't Matter by Young Thug and Millie Go Lightly. So like, <laughs> I'll listen to anything. So, um, but really, like, I find that like contemporary top 40, things like that, for the most part, doesn't really strike a chord with me. There will be a gem here and there where I'm like, that was incredible. And I'm so glad it made it to the mainstream. But you know, it's, uh, it's just a crap shoot with me. Sorry, that was a very vague <laughs> answer. <laughs> oh, no, it's all right. I mean, I think for for me at least, I listen to a, an assortment of genres. The one genre I don't listen to is the one that you love, which is rap. Like I don't listen to a lot of rap. One, I know. Hey, that's crazy. I mean, once in a while, there's a song or an album that I have to listen to just because yeah. people are like, "Hey, you gotta check this out. This is you're gonna, it's gonna change your life, or it's gonna change the way you see this genre." which was, yeah. I think that's the same way it's been for me for country and all this other stuff is like, you listen to this album or you listen to this artist and it, it changes your perspective on that genre that you never thought you'd love. And I guess what, like f for you, how do you define yourself as an artist as far as like what genre or are you kind of uh, a little, like a mix of everything? <laughs> So my line, right, is always I'm an opera singer that's signed to a rap label inspired by a rock band, right? So mm. there are a lot of lenses that yeah. are in tow when it comes to my music. Um, and I really believe with a project like Mystic, like this isn't me trying to be like, I'm a mystery. I'm so, so hard to define. Like it's not angsty like that. It's just I, believe, <laughs> I truly do believe it kind of transcends genre because there's nothing I've been able to pin down with it. Like if anyone asks, I'd say it's alternative because I don't know what to call it. Right. Um, we came from so many different influences with it because my process with my producer seven who like I said he's my hero my mentor I love him dearly he's my platonic soulmate um he I'll email him like a list of songs and a paragraph or two about like what inspired me from them and he never emails me back and then he sends me a beat and there were so many there was such a variety of music it was you know some rap here and there it was a lot of alternative and indie stuff you know there'd be a country song here there'd be an opera here and like it was just impossible to pin down what even inspired it and our real goal with it and what I think was a real blessing for myself and seven was that we didn't have to pick a genre with this right um we were they just sat us down and said make music and so we did and so oftentimes I hear my people, like my interviewers um, or my listeners and viewers reference me as like dark pop, which I'm okay with. It's like, it sounds kind of vampiric and angsty, so I'm all about it. But <laughs> yeah. like, um, I don't really know. I'm waiting for someone to tell me what I am. I have no idea. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I mean, is it much harder to like write music that way? It, so like, and what I mean by that is like, certain artists you know who they are you know what like genre they are so it's easier to write music to for that genre but for you you're you know you're not easily defined so is it harder to write music or is it more freeing to write music oh more freeing for sure for me at least because um like i said with the first album it was really a cam mckenzie do a pop album and that was extremely extremely difficult for me because even though it was one leg it wasn't who i am and I genuinely like my entire life. Okay, so like I feel like this is a good 
um, metaphor for my musical experience. So in high school, they had us as part of like our college prep department. Um, they had us take this huge test of like, what career would be good for you? And it was like questions like, would you enjoy building a birdhouse? And like random shit like that. <laughs> and then somehow after all these questions, they calculated like, you should go into engineering and you should go into this and so-and-so should go into that. And it was all in this circle graph, right? And then I got mine back and it just had a little dark spot in the center that said that they couldn't figure out what I should do. And I think that that's exactly how my entire life is. Like, because when it comes to like my interests, like even just my jobs, like I do so many weird side jobs and things across the label and things within my art that I'm like, I'm executive producing while I'm the artist, while I'm working in our social media and marketing department, while I'm over doing graphic design on the side. Like there's really, I can't pin down a single interest of mine. I always say like, I'm water, like I'm whatever you put in me or put me in, but I'm nothing in of myself. I just feel like huge blank canvas and you can just splatter paint on me and see how it goes. Um, and that's, again, like, I think because that's my personality and because that's kind of my approach to life that it mm. works for me, my music and it's where I'm most comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Like I totally understand that. Like for me as well, like I, uh, like I love doing these interviews. I love listening to new albums and having people kind of send me their stuff and just asking me for my opinion. But then I yeah. also love photography and I love shooting and I love going to shows and meeting new bands and, uh, you know, just connecting. I just love music in general. And so anytime I get to do anything in the realm of music, whether it's interviews, photography, um, or writing up these reviews for albums uh i never i never go this is who i am i'm always like i like i just like music and so whatever whatever um wherever music steers me whether it's this lane that lane or that lane i'll i'm down for the ride until i can't ride it anymore and so i'm, I'm kind of happy that there's more people like that people like you that like I can do music, but then at the same time, I can be an executive producer. I can be a marketer. I can be all of these things. And I think the best, and I think you probably just described what an artist is, is essentially, and people never, I don't think people ever look at it from that lens, but like, if you're an artist, you have to market yourself. You have to market your music. You have to be um, like business savvy. You have to be all these things that not, not that people don't really think about. They just see like, ooh, pop star, or, ooh, like superstar or, or singer and cool person. But they don't see like all the work that goes to creating that one image that people only see you as. Yeah, you're 100% right. And like, that's the thing that's really, oh my God, you just hit the nail on the head. I love this. Um, by the way, I want to see your photography if you're, if you're like open to that because I yeah. love photography but yeah um <laughs> i uh i like that's totally it because there's so much more to it than being an amazing artist it really you can be the most talented artist in the world but if you don't get business then it hurts you and that's like i get a lot of up-and-coming artists who come to me or interviewers come to me and are like what's your piece of advice for artists and i say learn the business because you know when you're sitting in these executive meetings and all this industry bs and there are all these ex like just executives around you they're going to talk at you they're going to talk through you they're going to talk over you but they won't speak to you because they think you're stupid and it's even worse if you're a female and it's even worse if you're young but just being an artist period people just don't expect you to know anything except for how to play a guitar or how to sing and so like the best thing you can do is know more than people think you do and i think that like a lot of times like societally we have this expectation that we should pick a trade and stick to it and that that's your thing and i think it's because we as human beings are pragmatic and want answers to things and want things to be very black and white but we like our minds are constructed in such a way that we our, our gifts are multifaceted, our talents are multifaceted, and our capabilities are so vast. And so I think when you try to just dedicate yourself to one thing, not only do you get burned out, in my opinion, but you hardly reach your potential. And I think the difference between highly successful people and people who just kind of end up in a rut is trying to utilize as much of their skill and as much of their interest as possible rather than just trying to pigeonhole themselves out of comfort. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. I mean... I feel I feel like a lot of artists nowadays, uh, and I see it more and more, have become their own kind of like business manager slash 
I don't, I don't even know what to say, but like they, they, they have to learn quickly. They have to um, be different aspects of their own business because no one can sell you on their, on their music or no one can sell you on their selves better than them. So they have to be their best, I guess. I don't even know what to call it. Like uh, pitch pitchers, like pitch meetings, you know, like yeah, yeah. like you have to be the best spokesperson for yourself. Exactly. You have to be your own wingman, you know? Yeah. And it's one of those things where like I made the mistake in the past um, because I was very young when, okay, so I've been recording professionally since I was nine. My solo career started when I was 15. And because I am, you know, very much a respect authority, respect the people that know what they're talking about um, and challenge yourself but also know when to shut up and listen type person. I made the mistake many times of allowing other people to make decisions for me and it never paid off for me. And so that really like was, I had years of learning um, what not to do. And then with Mystic, I really made sure that I almost to a disgusting degree was involved in everything and made all the decisions. Everything goes through. You can, my team probably hates me because <laughs> every single thing has to have, like I have to put my fingerprints on everything yeah, from yeah. like here's the movie poster I pick what it looks like I pick that I pick this to I copy edit everything to I design the booklet to like every possible thing that could be designed or copy edited or spell checked or like created I had to do myself and it was the best decision I possibly could have made and so again like it's it's like you're saying it's one of those things where you as the artist have to have that whole package and be well-rounded enough to make sure that you're represented properly. Yeah. Beautiful team and delegate, you know what I mean? Because that's yeah. hugely important. But I do truly and deeply believe that if you want it to be yours and you want to feel confident in your final product, that the key is making sure you invest in every aspect. Hmm. And I mean, I guess one big question that I had ready, but then because of uh all the pandemic things going on. I was going to ask you, what well, what are your goals for 2020? But I guess, uh, I guess, Stay I mean, alive. Being alive, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, if you do have any goals like this year, once, once life gets back to, uh, uh, some sort of assimilation of like normalcy and whatever mm -hmm. the new world is going to look like after this. Um, People hate me when they ask me these questions because I never have goals. My goal is to make art I like and be happy. And that sounds so cheesy, but it's so important to me because I have done a lot of time not doing that and not doing either of those things. And like, that's really what I have to dedicate myself to. Um, I think that goal setting, when, especially when it comes to art, is very dangerous because no matter what you accomplish, if you don't hit that one mark or do that one thing, you'll never be satisfied. And I don't like to set myself up for failure. And so say my goal is to win a Grammy, right? I could do a thousand other things. I could win this award, that award, impact this many people, you know, you know, God forbid, maybe we save a life, right? Or do something incredible like that. Mu the music does. But if I don't win that Grammy, am I ever going to be happy now? And so like, that's just my extreme example, right? Yeah. But um, I just want to continue to make good art, foster the community through that we've created through the art um, and be happy and satisfied with what I'm doing. Take care of my health you know, mentally, obviously, physically. Um, so there's my very vague answer. <laughs> and I was going to ask as well, like, what are your, uh, do you perform live? Like, do you, uh, do you, I'm guessing you do. And like, yeah. so what, what are your shows like, like usually? <laughs> okay. So I was doing, I was supposed to be on a six week tour this spring. That didn't happen. We played one show. Hmm. And so of all these other acts um, get on stage and it's like a boy band and super pop girl and all this stuff. And they're just getting the crowd super hyphy and super excited. And I'm scared shitless because that's not my music. <laughs> like I don't have very like lit performable music in that respect. So the first thing I said when I got on stage is I'm kill the mood real quick. And then the second thing I said was, when I was 18, I had a mental breakdown and nearly killed myself. And so, like, that's, I don't have a very, um, like, um, energetic performance in that respect. But my, the point of my performance is storytelling. So what I do, um, 
actually do is with this mystic perform set I have now for my live performances whenever they occur again, um, is I just tell the story of the album and walk people through it, you know, and it starts with, you know, I was in an abusive relationship with myself and that led to, you know, abusive relationships with others. Here was my darkest point. And then the most difficult choice to make was to get help and here's that moment. And then finally, like, here's what happens or I, what I hope happens on the other side of that and the journey that I'm constantly on and the process I'm constantly undergoing. And so did I have as many people come take pictures of me as they did with the boy band? No, but I did um, get the opportunity to actually have a lot of really meaningful conversations. Not that they didn't, I don't want to come off like that, but meaningful conversations with people who came up to me and were like, hey, like this really resonated with me and I really needed this right now. Or, hey, listen, this experience really was reminiscent of the song you played and things like that. So I'd say more than anything, my performances are really introspective. Um, and of course, it's a different vibe when I'm like playing like a strange music show, for, like a show with my label mates. Because first of all, I've been to over a thousand Tech Nine concerts. It's not an exaggeration. I've just been to that many. And so <laughs> like I get on stage at those shows. It's like family reunion for me because these people like have been watching me. They've been listening to my voice since I was nine. They've seen me at shows since I was a baby. So these people, I could be, I was four years old and people would be like, hey, Mackenzie and the crowd just because they know me and because I'm like, it's all a family at Strange Music and our fan base is all a family. And so when I get up on that stage, it's a little bit more hypey because like I'll play like a medley of all the features I've done with my fellow Strange artists and all of that. So it really depends. But when it's just a Mackenzie Nicole being Mackenzie Nicole show, it's very much uh now we're going to talk about our feelings moment <laughs> you know but i i enjoy doing it because ultimately like maybe one day i'll have very like party-esque music um i think my next album is very different from mystic the one i'm working on right now and it'll be a little bit more energetic and a little bit more fun but <laughs> until then it's just going to be like this kind of like it's just going to be kind of moody but that's how i am so i'm okay right with it. i mean i like moody music i feel like uh you know, every, you know, every song has its time and place. And I love listening to the moody, the moody stuff. I don't know why. It, it's one of my uh, things where people always look at me and they're like, Oscar, why do you listen to the sad music? I'm like, I don't know. It's, it's nice to listen to it. Like, I just find something beautiful about uh, just people kind of expressing their innermost kind of like demons or like kind of letting out all those things that I think and I always get into conversations with my, some of my music friends that like music sometimes can be a distraction or it can be uh, like, a, what's it called? An exorcism of like all of these things that you've had that you've felt you've had built up inside that you can just let it all out in this one song. Absolutely. I look at like my most recent example is um, I had this ex-boyfriend right who i've remained friends with after this relationship but he was liable to just freak out and like scream at me at any moment for no apparent reason and stuff like that but i was the crazy one i was the problem and so like i listened to yesterday i was listening to shutter island by jesse reyes and she has this amazing hook where she's just screaming into the mic my straight jacket's custom made though and i'm like <laughs> like and that was like a moment of like true like release and like that song is just like really I can engage with it right now in a really authentic way but at the same time then I go listen to an artist like Aries who's this amazing more underground artist who I've been following for a while um a little bit over a two years now go check him out I think you'd like him um he is a genius and his music like is so abstract and while it like really like unearths a lot of emotions for me it's also a huge process of artistic discovery and like you know trying to decipher the poetry and so I do like you know there's there's depth to happiness right um and there's always that running joke of happy people make shitty art but <laughs> which I, part of me is like and so but there's also like and I think there's a lot to be said for you know joy and bliss and all that but I think that like I said and like my, my entire persona is kind of being just a little vampire so like I like that I like that 
you know, kind of darker t undertone, you know what I mean? Like, and so I think you hear that in a lot of my music, even like, though I have super pop songs like Complications, which is the single I released right before Mystic. And it's, it was, it was the first time I had creative control, right? But Mystic was the first full project where I had creative control. Complications is a super that 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 type song, right? Yeah. And like, it's so upbeat that like, by the end of it, you want to blow your brains out because it's like so bubblegum. But the entire song is about me being like this horrible masochist and ruining my own life so like even then like I can't be happy <laughs> but no I hear you on that all this to say that that's kind of my taste too yeah and so I want to talk about so you're going to be performing on uh, Sound Minds songs that save me on May 28th yes and that is is that going to be through like I'm guessing through like an online video oh uh, it's going to be through Instagram live Instagram um, live when I always second guess myself after I say things like that. I'm like, Oh my God, is it? Um, so <laughs> hopefully you can like edit that out if I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm we, we'll find but, a way. We'll find a way. Right. Um, it's a, uh, it's a really incredible opportunity. Cause like I just went live with Chris from sound mind um, and on Instagram live for, like I said, my little quarantine sucks Wednesday lives. And he and I were discussing like our experiences, both being bipolar and what Sound Mind stands for. And their organization is all about um, expanding the dialogue surrounding mental health, wellness, and illness um, with music and with art. And I think that's really beautiful, obviously. And they really foster um, a beautiful community, offer a lot of resources for people um, and all that, um, all that. I just did them a huge disservice by just pretending like you can just throw away that. <laughs> but, and they're, <laughs> really amazing organization and so for them to invite me into this event is really important and basically the premise of it if you don't mind me going into it yeah. is that, you know everyone has or most people I should say I don't want to generalize probably have the song that met, means that to them you know what I mean like that is so important to them or speaks to their character or defined a period defines them and they wanted artists um, like me to share what that song is for us and the song that you know as, as the name implies song that saves them and um or saved whatever tense you want to use um, for me my song is hurt by johnny cash that i've mentioned before or i'm sorry hurt a cover by johnny cash because every time i'm like i love hurt by johnny cash about three thousand people are like it's nine inch nails and then i just want to like kill everybody but <laughs> <laughs> um it's it's my favorite song and like for me if you don't do you mind if i kind of delve into why i chose that song yeah go ahead um for me you know i really i always kind of viewed myself especially when i was younger as like this angel of death right where and that sounds very dramatic but i genuinely felt like everything i touched just rots and a lot of that comes from what we've referenced several times now, which is me not really loving myself, um, but also just some experiences I've had in life that were really negatively um, impactful. And so I heard hurt and for the first time, and it brought me to tears. I was sobbing because first of all, Johnny Cash is one of the most talented um, voices in history, singer-songwriters yeah. in history, in my opinion. But the tortured tone of his voice as he says what have I become and I will let you down I will make you hurt it spoke to me so much because I saw my future in it you know if I continue on this path of feeling that I am this person or that this is the effect I have on people I'm going to be Johnny Cash's age or the age he was when he recorded that obviously rest in peace and I'm going to look back on my empire of dirt as he puts it and feel nothing but regret and pain and I don't want that I can't bear that because I already feel that way and I can't spend the rest of my life in that way so it was like this prophecy that I decided not to fulfill and that's why that song impacts me so much and what I think is so beautiful about it the last lyrics being if I could start again a million miles away I would keep myself I would find a way well I am a million miles away right now and I can't start again and I will keep myself and I will find a way and I will not get to a point where this song is who I am. And so even though it's a beautiful song, I don't want it to be my life story. So that's why I chose that song. I love it. I cannot wait to perform it. Um, and so I th I'm really excited about it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm excited to check it out too. I'm ready to see you perform live. And I mean, I guess the last thing I'm gonna ask you is like if for all the listeners and all the people watching, 
uh, when this goes up, uh, what kind of message do you have for people right now? Any kind of, it doesn't have to be hopeful. It doesn't have to be like super duper happy, but like, what, what's like, what's one message you want to put out into the universe? So the thing that's most important to me right now, um, and obviously this is largely due to the subject matter of my album, is uh, mental and spiritual healing. Um, because I think that we should prioritize our mental and spiritual bodies like we do our physical bodies, and we just don't. Like societally, we don't value that the way we should. And um, I know a lot of people are suffering. I was suffering for a really long time. And I know when you're down the rabbit hole, when you're in the dark, um, the feeling of futility and impossibility, right? Um, and how the light just seems, it's not that there's a light at the other end of the tunnel, right? It's that the light's invisible and it's just, you search and you search and you can't seem to find it. Um, and my line lately has been, you are not the special case that cannot be solved, right? No matter who you are, I truly deeply believe that there's something that can help you, some place, someone, something, some noun, right? Yeah. That is capable of helping, um, readjust and reform your life and who you are in the most positive way and so i guess my message is encouraging and hopeful despite what you said uh, <laughs> where it's you know like if it's not in your immediate vicinity you just have to keep searching and i know it sounds so impossible because if someone had said this to me when i was in the deepest darkness i would have been like get away from me you stupid idiot like <laughs> and so but like as someone who's making my way towards you know the other side whatever that means um i just i just want to remind people and encourage people that it there is everyone has a chance to be better you know and i think for the most part you know i think if if you're hearing this you probably deserve to feel better so that's where i'm at with it that's what i want to send out to the universe and to anyone that might be listening or viewing this all right. Well, thank you, Mackenzie, for taking the time to talk to me. <laughs> and so you did such a cute young thing, and your questions were great. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And so, lastly, again, where can people find you on social media? Is it all one thing, or do you have a website people can go to? So, at Thrill Mackenzie Nicole on Instagram, at Mackenzie Nicole on Twitter, Mackenzie Nicole on everything else, including every streaming platform. And you can see my profile and buy my merch on Strange Music Inc.'s website. So, yeah, there you go. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, honey. I'll talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye.